Hey there, Lone Star College family. This is Megan Hopwood from Lone Star College North of Harris, joining you once again for Tabletop Thursday. Last time we got together, we talked about Dungeons & Dragons and how to play Dungeons & Dragons or any tabletop role-playing game online. We talked about a lot of different really useful tools to facilitate a game, but today we're going to focus a little more on how to be a dungeon master. How do you actually run a game? I'll talk a little bit about my experience, and I have two wonderful guests today who are also going to share their dungeon mastering experience. Let's go ahead and meet them. So today I am joined by two really wonderful dungeon masters who are here to share some of that wisdom as well. First, we have Ian Hopwood. Hello. And we have Lloyd Hewan. Well, hello. So guys, can you tell us a little bit about your dungeon master experience? Like how long have you been a dungeon master and some of the systems that you've used? I have been DMing on and off for, I think, almost a decade now. Pretty close to it there. I started with Dungeons & Dragons 3rd Edition and 3.5. I've Since then, I've also done Star Wars D20, the modern Star Wars version by Fantasy Flight Games, Vampire the Masquerade, World of Darkness, a little bit of Shadowrun, and a few other smaller systems, but mainly in the D&D realm of things. Awesome. Lloyd, how about you? Well, my experience is going to pretty much mirror Ian's there simply because he's the one who got me into Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> it all started when we, we were working together and he introduced me as well as maybe a few other coworkers to 3.5. So that's where I really jumped in. And from there, I tried a little bit of Pathfinder, 4th Edition, Star Wars, Edge of Empire, Shadowrun, Vampire. There's been so many different systems, it's crazy. But I've DM'd a few sessions uh, with you guys as well as with a few others. And each session, I just sort of learn a little bit more about how much DMing is very hard and I'm very bad at it. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds about right. I think we all have that feeling that we're really bad at it, which brings me to our next slide, which is DMing the expectation that we're going to go on this wonderful magical adventure versus the reality of DMing, which is we have no idea what's going on either, and that's okay. <laughs> so do you guys have any experience of carefully planning your game and, and knowing what you want to have happen, and then have your players just take a right turn at Albuquerque and you end up in a completely different place? I've got one that springs to mind. It actually involves you there, Megan. Um, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so there was, there was a session we were we were running and it wasn't a module or anything it was a it was a source book that was pulling in elements from a world in magic the gathering called zendikar and do you remember a girl who was being chased and you guys followed and killed the thing that was chasing her and then went and fought that thing's master it was a vampire oh, oh. <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> yeah so there was a scene in which i had set up the idea was to be a, a hook of some sort to maybe get them to interact with either the character or the thing chasing it it ended up going into, it was basically a servant of a vampire they were fighting off. It ended up with them going after the vampire who created it. And they fought the vampire and killed him. He had this like cool bone throne and this goblet of blood. And Megan's character decided to drink it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I and did. So I had not planned for that to happen specifically, but... It became a thing where then Megan's character, she contracted vampirism. I had to f think of a way to maybe just have your character still be cool. And vampires aren't in that setting. They weren't something that was going to die to sunlight or anything like that. But it was just, okay, this is really weird. I didn't expect this at all. Why would you drink the goblet full of blood? But that's the sort of things that just happen. You have characters who can impart their, their will upon the world that you're trying to form here. And that can go completely awry. And that's sort of what happened. But the fun from that is seeing those things happen and then trying to roll with it. It's a very interesting sort of yes and or uh, what, what's the, the comedic styling? What is that called? Uh, improv? improv. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a very fun improv style. You stretch and flex those muscles and it's pretty fun. That's that's one of the things that stood out to me right away was like, oh yeah, that time Megan drank blood when I didn't expect her to do that. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, Lloyd, you did this right back to me in our most recent fifth ed game where we were visiting Ian's character's homeland and they were having a religious ceremony and you decided that you were just going to join their religion and swear an oath to their God. I mean, 
they had like cool powers and stuff. And then I turned to blue, which is really cool too. So I say that's a win. I think it's <laughs> for overall, it's been a it's been a win. Yeah, I would agree. Part of DMing is adapting to the unforeseen circumstances your players are going to get into. It comes up no matter how well you plan. All it takes is one person going, "Oh, there was a door here. I don't like that door. Let's just turn around and leave the dungeon." Like, wait, what? You're playing Dungeons and Dragons and you want to leave the dungeon? Yeah, I don't. I don't want to do it being here right now. Uh, what do you? Uh, uh, okay, I mean, it's very true. Stranger things happen. It's so easy to just have people completely throw you off track. But let's go kind of cycle back to the beginning of how we talk to our players and how we set that expectation of what's going to happen, or at least attempt to set the expectation of what's going to happen in Dungeons and Dragons. And it's really important to be on the same page as your group. So setting those play expectations together, what kind of world is this? What sort of magic is acceptable? What are the things that are kind of happening uh, in this world? But not just in the world itself, but also how often are we going to play? What is the expectation of the amount of time that you're going to have to sit down and be with other people? Are you expected to play online? Are you going to be at someone's house? Is it okay to eat while we're playing? And then also seeking feedback from your players and making sure that they're having fun, making sure that checking in with yourself too and making sure you're still having fun. So how do you guys kind of set those expectations with your players and, and how do you elicit that feedback so that you feel like everybody is communicating well? If you're going to get into this and you, you've got a group of people that you need to sit down and just talk about what everybody wants. This is, if it's your first time playing and you're or DMing or even playing and you're like, I want to, we want to try this and see how it is. It's okay. Go in, maybe do a demo game and then kind of do a summary afterward. And be like, did we enjoy this? What didn't we like? What don't, what did you like? If they liked it, try and set the next game then, because if you don't, it's really easy, especially with everything in your life. It's like, oh, we were supposed to play again and we never rescheduled that and it's been two months. I've, I've seen that happen and that's happened with groups I've belonged to. It's like, oh, hey, we played two months ago and what's going on with this? Like, oh, well, we're all busy now. So we're, we'll, we'll find time to play again. And then just the whole thing fizzles out. So it's like, if you're getting into it, make sure you start asking those questions as soon as you can to start trying to get a steady group going and game going and kind of get an idea for what people like. Yeah, a lot of that determining what people like and what they expect can be done with what's called a session zero, which I have not done in any of my game. I've seen it used. And it's something that I think is worthwhile for anyone who's starting off with maybe a group that you're unaware of. Maybe it's random people that you met online. Maybe it's new folks at a card shop or a game store or something like that. Or even it's your friends and it's just your first time playing with them. A lot of times what people expect from Dungeons and Dragons can be vastly different. Someone may want a really high fantasy, fun, intrigue plot, and then someone else may just want to kill things and get the best stats. It's entirely dependent on what the players want. And so a session zero is where you can maybe set aside your idea as a DM of what you expect or what you had planned on, and then gather feedback from players to start working towards what they want to do and take those things in little bits and intersperse them throughout your campaign as you run it. I've seen this in other groups that I've I've been part of. Uh, there was actually a big kerfuffle with one just recently, and it had to do with uh, the DM having an expectation that was vastly different from the rest of the players. And so they also didn't really take feedback to heart, it seemed like. So, you know, what, like you were saying, Ian, the getting everyone on the same page and talking and having those discussions afterwards to see if everyone's still having fun. Those are things that it's just vital conversation uh, and communication is good with any relationship. And that includes with your players. If it's a new group, like this is the first time you and your friends are playing. It, this is really hard to know what everybody's going to want out of the game. So it's especially, it's really important there to do like post game summary too. The first time Megan or Lloyd played D and D, you don't know what to really expect. <laughs> I still don't know what to expect at the time when I play. Yeah. I was like, that's that's true because you know every game and every dm and every story and every player does things and expects things and wants things or it is involved in different ways and it can really alter how a game is if just one player does something that another player likes or dislikes because they can they can take it personally so it's, it's really important to keep the communication lines open with everybody and make sure everyone is having fun because if one person isn't having fun it can really tank the gaming group real quick. And we try not to take things personally, but sometimes it can cause problems with your friendships. So making sure you're open and honest and communicate with everybody is really important. 
Absolutely. So there are a couple of different ways that we're going to talk about DMing. And one way that we've kind of mentioned a little bit already is if you're using a module. Now, a module is like a pre-written, pre-created adventure by someone else. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with these. These are a great way to get started. They're a really awesome way to step foot into D&D, especially when you don't know how to tell your own story. But it's absolutely, absolutely critical that you read the entire module. And then after you read the module, you need to read it again. And probably a third time. And then after that, you need to read it again. You need to take notes. You need to highlight. You need to mark important pages with, with post-it notes. Like all of those note-taking things that are extremely emphasized in your English and history and humanities classes, all of those things are just so essential to making the most out of using a module. And then when you get into a module, you also want to make sure that you understand the people that are in it, the non-player characters or NPCs, like what motivates those people, what makes them stand out. If there isn't a whole lot, what can you add to them to give them a little bit more flavor? And then also the same thing with the, the monsters and if there are any puzzles, what can those monsters do? And this is where you want to have beautiful created spreadsheets of what all of those monsters do. What kind of attacks do they have? What are their stats? It's really nice to have all of that in like a, an easy access spreadsheet. Have you guys ever used a, a module? And, and if you did, how did you prepare to use it? I don't know if I've ever really done it in any of my games, but they are great resources for ideas as well. So if you aren't one to run a module, you can absolutely use them as like a, an idea source. But yeah, Ian, have you run any modules? I have run at least three separate modules, all of them with varying degrees of success. In fact, I would never call one a complete success as the module was intended to be run. Uh, my first DMing experience was actually with a module. It was the short chapter at the end of the Star Wars D20 book that was set on Naboo and did all those things. And like, I let the players get away with things they probably shouldn't have and it kind of derailed the module pretty quick, which is just my inexperience as a DM letting them have a grenade launcher was probably a bad idea. <laughs> no, that's never a bad idea. <laughs> when they blow the main villain's speeder out of the air before the escape scene, it was kind of, yeah. Anyways, I have run another module for Iron Kingdoms, which I know Megan has also run this one, and we both compared notes at the end of running that and went, it's really hard to do a mystery if you aren't prepared to put in the effort to do a mystery. Because it's really easy, obvious when you go, hey, here's this NPC, but you've never mentioned another NPC before. Or like, hey, let me just tell you about the side character. Don't worry about them. And that's like, well, why did you tell us about them? It's, it's, it's a really big red flag that you should probably pay attention to this person when the DM just suddenly drops a hint. The red flags are there and it's like, well, if this is supposed to be a mystery, these just right in our face and we know where it's coming. And then there was my last attempt at a module, which is when I was like, modules are great for ideas, but I'm going to run with them my own way, which was my first experience running D&D 5th Ed. After three sessions, nobody in the party or myself liked where it was going. So I went, okay, here's the pieces of the module that I've given them. Here's the information they have. What can I do with this? And it ended up with actually Lloyd's character taking over a capital city. Yes. <laughs> Not at all in the module. There was no real reason for him to become the mayor of that town. But it happened. Things just kept going, and I kept just kind of going, yes, and, or mm, not quite, but let's see what else I can, you know, and adapting. I think we, uh, I think we also incited a rebellion of the lower working class. I think I that mean, was part of that. When you're yeah. trying to eradicate the bourgeoisie. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Ian, you actually kind of got into my next slide, which is that you are not stuck in the module. If you are playing a module, it is absolutely okay to go off and do your own thing, which it sounds like is how most of us have, have used a module. The one example that I had that's a semi-famous D&D &D is the Lost Minds of Fandelver uh, became what we know as the Adventure Zone. Here there be Gerblins. So, so Ian, you answered my next question too, which is really great. When we get off module, we get to planning your own adventure. And how do you go about doing that? My advice is to plan incredibly loosely. It's really hard to have a story that you want to tell and then tell it 
and have your players just in a box in that story. It doesn't leave room for there to be any kind of player agency. And you want to make sure that the choices that your characters make have room to impact the rest of the world. So how do you guys prepare for when you guys are dungeon mastering? How long does that preparation generally take you? For me, it usually starts with a world idea if I'm doing something on my own. Or if I'm pulling information from another source, I'll dig into that and try and learn as much about the established uh, setting that I can. And then from there, in most cases for me, I usually plan out the introduction of a player to this setting so that hopefully they can get dragged into the, the world itself as well. But from, from there, it's more of a, I might have some NPCs set up, some other things set up. But I don't know where they'll go with anything. So a lot of it's like overarching, here's the world, here's the idea of what I want to maybe have happening in that world, and then we'll see what sort of hooks they bite on. Because like you've all experienced, no one's going to follow your stuff to, to a key. So planning super detailed for me is usually not something I'll do. I'll do a very general idea and then go from there, which I guess is where I enjoy the yes anding, because that means that all of a sudden I have an NPC on the spot that I have to make up a name for, as well as a backstory maybe, and some idea of how they how they see the party, the world itself, you know, like what is, what is their role within that, that whole space. Mm -hmm. Because of this, this also means that the players would have a lot of agency in what they can do, because I don't have a very detailed plan. That means that if the players want to go off and do something else, much like with Ian's campaign with the module, they said where my character ended up running a city. That's the sort of thing that I try and leave room for as well if I can, because then it's, this is what they obviously want to do. Go for it, do it, have fun. We'll go, we'll follow that path. You get what you put into it. I mean, if you spend five minutes and go, oh yeah, that's where we're, I'll figure it out. If you're really good at improv and can do that, cool. You know, more power to you. But most of us can't just go, here's an adventure, go on it and make it memorable and interesting. One of my favorite games that I ran started with an idea from one of the characters' backstories and it was supposed to just be an introduction to a friend to teach them how to play D&D &D and ended up being a three or four game session that was about a beer run. After the first session, I kind of looked at what we had and was like, okay, we can do this, we can do this. And I put probably a couple hours of work just thinking about it. When I'm planning a session, doing something like going for a walk or a jog or whatever, thinking about it in the back of my head. I'm really bad about taking detailed notes until I'm suddenly in a panic situation of how do I rescue a campaign? And then there'll be lots of flow charts. That's just me. We all, we all do things a little different. What is your usual plan, Megan? You seem like uh, one who is very detailed because your notes are always really good whenever you recite them back. I have a, I want to say 30 page Google doc that I've been using for our current campaign that's been running for about a year. And I have notes about NPCs. I have notes about stuff that you guys did that is insane. I have notes about different monsters you've encountered and how many turns it took you to kill them. I make sure I use those, those header markers so that I have a chapter list that I can go back and click on. The game that we're playing, you guys revisit places frequently you guys go back to the same towns so i want to make sure i remember which npcs are in town and what were they doing the last time you saw them for me an important tool when i was planning out a more detailed campaign was uh, OneNote because it does that sh uh, heading thing in a very tabular like notebook style away so it's like mm -hmm. oh here's my tab for this city and i can have a tab of npcs within that city and like you can create these really deep detailed documents to keep that all straight you have to keep up with it that otherwise to be the common get that. rule there is mm -hmm. to keep up with your notes yeah. yeah taking notes is super important so but moving from that is is also knowing what your players have and what they what they can do so that you can integrate that into your world as well so having access to their character sheets through something like D&D &D Beyond or just having a copy, or if you want to keep everyone's character sheet rather than sending their character sheets home with them at the end of a session, that's that's one way you can do it. Uh, but knowing their backstories, there's a thing in D&D &D 5th edition that kind of has built-in ways to give characters backstories if you don't know how to do it. It's the ideals, bonds, and flaws. And there are actually tables that you can roll on to give them random characteristics, random ideals, random flaws. But do they have any loved ones? Do they have any cultural customs? Is there something about 
the race that they picked that is very unique to them. And this is where you get kind of back to the idea of having a session zero. Like, what do you what do you need to know about your players so that you can make them feel like really part of the world? So do you guys have like a character that stood out to you, even if it's not your character, but one that you DM for? And what about that character was was really memorable that really made them feel like they were part of the world? I'd say in current session, y'all's your character, Ian, is actually uh, one that's imparted a lot simply because of the backstory that you created for it and how there's yeah. that whole religion. They're actually in the game Megan's running for us right now, like because we did a lot of the world building and stuff. The character that I'm playing is probably the one I'm most attached to because I'm invested in his backstory. Like I helped create the backstory of his people, the god that helped create their people, and all of this. Apart from my character, I think probably the most memorable for me is actually Hala Stockwell, which was a character my wife played during a D&D sh- game we played to introduce a friend to the game. Would you like to describe Hollis? So Hollis Stockwell is, is my my favorite character that I have ever played. And Hollis had a kind of secret backstory from the rest of the group that he was supposed to be this master beer brewer. When he was coming of age and did his first batch of beer, he poisoned his entire town. And so he stole his father's backstock of beer and ran away so that he wouldn't have to face that. And then his bar that he founded using his father's brew got burned down and all the beer was stolen and he needed to get it back because he couldn't brew anymore. But the other players only knew that that his beer was stolen. They didn't know about his his backstory. But that really did kind of found what was happening in the rest of the world. And now he makes many appearances in many of our games. And now Hollis <laughs> is, is a constant NPC. We we do love him. But speaking of of NPCs, let's let's kind of talk about how do we how do we make NPCs? So how do you make a fully realized creation? What what do people need to become people? They need they need something that motivates them. They need to have like a thing whether it's something for the party to remember them by maybe they have one leg or one eye or the one that i have pictured here is the image that i think of with one of my favorite current npcs bonnie who is a 10 year old bartender lich. slash mayor slash sheriff that our entire party thinks is a lich <laughs> it is a lich lord she is she most is definitely not. she is not uh, but that's her thing is she's a she's 10 years old and she runs the tavern in this small village and the rest of the village is totally cool with it. And my players were horrified, but also they need to have relationships, not just relationships to like your characters, maybe, but what kind of relationships do they have with with other NPCs or with villains or with other people around. And I put this in here. I feel like a voice, even a bad voice, can be incredibly memorable. How, how do you guys feel about, about making NPCs? What are some, some that you have made that you feel like were especially memorable that either the party just likes or like absolutely despises? Uh, I remember Talk, the goblin. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> which was an NPC that was supposed to be a guide for you. I thought you guys were having a horrible time with him because you guys, especially your character, Megan, you were just on his butt so much. I was like, well, they must hate this. I should probably do something about it. So I killed him, and you were quite upset that I killed him. (laughs) (laughs) It was the kind of character you just love to hate, and he was just our our punching bag, and when he was gone, there was no one left to punch. It was horrible. (laughs) <laughs> i was so sad that you took him away from me <laughs> maybe it was like a little brother moment like oh you know i'll beat up on him because the little brother or something but yeah there, that was an interesting one i and the thing was that character was literally just started out as maybe someone who can help guide the characters as a dm voice instead of just going go here it would be like something that you know oh that's a trap maybe you should not do that because this guide has been doing these things forever and knows these things. That one was an interesting game where I was starting things out. But there was also that one that we did just for a little bit. We had maybe done two or three sessions. And uh, there was an inventor and artificer that you'd run into. There was the prospect of creating a flying ship. But his character, I had started to create in my mind a motivation. Like what prompted him to 
to be in this position in this world? What is his drive? And then their relationship to other entities within there. So there was the fact that he wanted you to go basically hijack some plans from another area. That was like his relationship with some of the, the other entities within the world. And his voice, I think, was something that I British... I can't remember. That's usually a go-to, isn't it? Like, it's either British, or if you're in the South in America, it's usually a Southern twang or something like mm-hmm. that. Bonnie has a deep Georgia kind of twang that I thought you guys would find endearing. <laughs> I mean, it'd be endearing if she wasn't a lich lord. That's the thing. <laughs> <laughs> She's not a lich lord. You guys are so sure that this 10-year-old little girl that just happens to run a tavern is evil and i promise she's just a little girl and that's what i'm sticking to until i turn her into (laughs) (laughs) a lich lord yeah final boss here we go (laughs) big bad evil is is bonnie but for for npcs it's uh it's very much like what you're saying oftentimes i sort of have to put myself within their shoes and see if i can empathize with the character are they in in a situation of plight sometimes it's hard for them to empathize with an npc and oftentimes i find that this might lead to random deaths of npcs that you may create (laughs) Are you saying sometimes players get a little bloodthirsty and kill NPCs for no good reason? No, no. no. Yeah, it happens all the time. A little murder is is pretty common. We did hold a criminal trial or attempt to based off of the actions of NPCs in that world. You did. Because of our, our player characters' reactions. It didn't necessarily go well, but... That was a tough session. There's also the bandits that you guys said I kidnapped. And I was like, no, no, he's just, it was like an arrest, essentially. And then from there, it was like, you did wrong. I'm not going to just kill you like the rest of your party. Marius did kind of a scared straight with that NPC as you dragged him into a tower full of zombies and (laughs) tried to change his mind about being a villain. And then you got him a job. I mean, we were sort of on the way to the Tower of Zombies anyway. It wasn't like, a, hey, we'll drop you off at the next 7-Eleven. I ain't going to let you just go. Go out in the world. You're sticking with us. As a DM, I'll try and impart those things that can hopefully make other players empathize or sympathize with the character a little bit. And that becomes difficult because a lot of times I'm like, do I really want to delve this much into like a shopkeep? There is where I usually find myself improving a lot because I can have backstories for a lot of the main characters within a town, but it may be like, hey, this little kid's on the side of the road and he's just begging for coin and then off the story goes in that direction. So now you have to think of something for that character. Also, one thing I'll say, no matter how many times you do it, having to have NPC characters talk to each other is one of the worst experiences as a DM because it's basically you talking to yourself for 20 minutes sometimes to convey information. Mm -hmm. And if you can do silly voices, do it because it'll break up the monotony. I am terrible at voices. I cannot hold a fake voice for more than a minute. And if they do, they all turn into drunk Scottish pirates and it's just terrible. I think we need to play a Scottish pirate game. I think that we just need to play to your strengths. If I have to have two NPCs talking to each other or sometimes three to convey information. Nobody wants to hear me talk to myself for 20 minutes, but sometimes you do it for the story. If you trust your players, you can have them play NPCs. You've done this in a couple of our games, Lloyd, where you just randomly decided you were going to play the NPC like (laughs) an innkeeper or a random bar patron. And there was no real stage direction there, but it worked and it just added a little bit to the world. So if you can plan that, you know, hey, we're going to have this NPC here. Here's some characteristics. There's a level of investment the DM has to put in for NPCs. So it's like, if they're going to be somebody they're going to meet again, you're going to want to put in more details and backstory than, hey, we passed this guy on a cart while we're riding between towns. What's the chance you're going to run into them again? I mean, you could make them a recurring character like the Cabbages guy from Avatar The Last Airbender, or they could just be Joe the Merchant who happen to have some items. I have a good example and a bad example of this. We have in our current fifth ed game, we have Celeste, the cactus juice merchant that you guys have run into several times on the road and bought cactus juice from. And she has a life and you've been to her cactus farm where she juices her cactuses and she's told you stories. And that's my good one. And then we have the bad one, which was the apple merchant that I put zero thought into. That apple merchant was going to kill us. That apple merchant was shady. 
There's no reason for an apple merchant randomly on that side of town. No way. They were told. He was like, buy my apples. I can't leave until you buy my apples. That's because he had no life outside of that apple cart. So of course he can't leave. And then you guys were very concerned that he was magically tied to this apple cart and that it was cursed. And then you guys left. I had these wonderful magic apples for you. And because of how I introduced that NPC, it just completely ruined (laughs) any chances of you buying some magic apples. That kind of goes full circle to something I was talking about earlier. What you do with that can really determine these flags for these characters, even if you didn't intend it. Like, you did not intend that apple merchant to seem kind of sinister, but the way you introduced him and the way that it happened, it just felt that way, so we responded off that. We could have become like, oh, well, this apple cart salesman is obviously magically bound here. Well, let's spend the next 14 sessions trying to free him from this magical curse. You can't plan for stuff like that, so that's why notes are great, but you got to adapt some ideas sometimes along the way. Absolutely. And that includes how we sculpt that environment that those NPCs live in. That kind of gets us back to how do we paint the word picture? How do things smell? How does it taste? What can you hear? You have an environment that you're trying to manage, that your characters are living in, that your non-player characters are living in. We talked a little bit about when you're trying to run a mystery, you want to be You have that that Han Solo, I don't know, fly casual, when you want them to notice something, so you kind of try to casually mention it, but it's a really hard balance to strike. There are stats and things built into a lot of role-playing games to try and convey hidden information. But as a player and as a DM, I don't like taking things that far out of a player's hand. Yeah, they have a passive perception. They're supposed to notice things. But is it really just that generic or should I be making them get involved and actually investigate? It's a Mm -hmm. really interesting balance trying to find a consistent tone and consistent level of description for your game so that everything feels unique and interesting, but also conveys these hidden meanings if you're trying to do traps and puzzles and things. Yeah, and that can be just incredibly difficult. I like the idea of rolling for characters. Stealth check is a really interesting mechanic in Dean. You roll a dice, A, if it's a high value, you're probably sneaky. Should the players know what that value is? You can roll their perception and you as the DM can roll stealth. And while they think they're being stinky, maybe you rolled in that one and they're actually incredibly loud. That's a lot easier nowadays with tools like the Indie Beyond where I can go, oh, what's you know my player stealth? Okay, I can roll that. When I started DMing, none of these tools were available. So unless I had their character sheet or had written all of this stats down, it'd be like, oh, I need to see your character sheet for a minute. It's like, oh, well, he's going to do something. Something. If you're trying to hide details, you're going to have to describe a bunch of stuff in this room and not 90% of it shouldn't be a clue so that they actually have to try and figure it out. For me, oftentimes I'm trying to make sure that the environment plays a heavy role in a lot of those skills if I can. One of the best examples I can think of was this was a first time session for some players and there was a character who had decided to go off to the nobles part of town. They had really nice shrubberies and bushes and trees and stuff like that. Very well landscaped and manicured area, all within a walled garden sort of thing. And they had decided to try and sneak in so they got through and then they wanted to raise hell a little bit and create a diversion and they lit fire to the garden area. Well, one of the things they were saying was, well, it's dark outside, it's night, I'm going to stealth through. And I was like, cool. The guards in the area just saw a fire go up and that light illuminated you. You're harder to stealth unless you get away from what you're doing. But they had continuously gone around and literally lit up the entire garden. So instead of having a nice, easy stealth check in the dark, they had thrown light into the entire area and basically made themselves an easier target. They were caught and imprisoned, which was quite interesting for the rest of the party to find out in the morning, like, hey, what happened to that character? Well, they're in jail. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, like those sorts of things where you paint that word picture, where you describe the area and someone wants to do something, and then trying to make sure that that plays a part in the things that they're doing so and i'll try and paint that word picture if they can't so if they just say i roll stealth then it'll be something where i as a dm will try and make it so that their skills match up with what's going on within the world too i think it helps them feel a little bit more invested in what they're doing because now it's instead of just saying i'm rolling the dice and seeing a a result it's i'm rolling the dice to do this thing that you've described a little bit for me and it makes it feel a little bit more real. Kind of following the same thing. There's not just a level of detail from the DM. If you can have your players helping write those word pictures too, because a description of, oh, I swing with my sword is 
kind of bland. So if the players can add their own descriptions and their own worlds to help flesh it out, it helps everybody play off that momentum and it can really help the world building. And there are ways of rewarding players for good descriptions. An old DM of mine used to give bonus points to your roles if you described your actions in a good amount of detail or in a unique way because it rewards players for just putting a little bit of extra effort in. It doesn't. It wasn't a huge reward. It's like, oh, you get a plus one to your role because you described that well. It's not going to usually make or break the thing but it's it's a nice incentive to keep your players also engaged and building and helping create these worlds so do you guys have some favorite descriptive words that you like to use that aren't too gross if we're in a forest it's always the smell of heavy earth and soil beneath your feet the dappled sunlight poking through the branches the movement in the underbrush that sort of thing like just pulling those descriptive words that you often see in books that you're reading that really get you there food is always a big one anytime you're talking about food if you can make your players hungry i think you've won right (laughs) i think that's a win yeah (laughs) other than that the worst one is probably moist you just say moist and people are like, oh, <laughs> no. <laughs> the slime just slops onto the floor. You see its moist gelatinous body ooze out and then Ooh. reform. You know, oh, like that. I'm so unhappy right now. Perfect, see? Take inspiration from what you've been reading or what you like. Different authors describe things different way. If you like their style and you feel you can kind of play off that, do that. You don't need to be writing Tolkien levels of detail for every bit of scenery in your game, but make it feel like a world. So let's get back to our players. We've talked about the yes and, and actions having consequences with, hey, you lit everything on fire. Now the guards can see you and you're going to jail. How do you go about putting in these consequences? How do you do the yes and, and maybe the contrary to that, the no but? How do you use those improvised skills to enact consequences on your players? And do you have any unexpected consequences that your players were really surprised by a lot of times someone does something they've lost a quest line on something then well you can't just have that happen so maybe make things a little bit more difficult i don't think you ever want to outright stop characters from doing anything that would be unfun to everyone little red bumps is usually what i see the example there that person wanted to go out and do crazy things that's cool you can do it there are consequences. You are now in jail, you know, and that lowered their standing with the rest of the guard, who they were trying to work with. And there was a guy on the inside on with the guards, a spy sort of person, and they had totally messed that up. He had gotten really close to being found out. And in order to get them out, he pretty much had to just cut all ties. His character then became someone who couldn't go back to being that mole. Those sorts of consequences are things that I try and do simply because it feels like it would be what would happen in the real world, right? I know we're in a world of fantasy, but having consequences means that you're you're going to be invested in things if all of a sudden something happens and it prevents you from doing something a certain way. You're going to be like, oh man, okay, maybe I shouldn't just go kill people randomly to get information. If when they don't tell me, I just stab them. Those sorts of things I try and put in myself. Ian, what have you used? Or, or Megan, what have you used? I, uh, I had a player who was a constant thief. No matter where they went, they were stealing something. Their roles were really good though, so they kept succeeding at all of their theft, and so they had all this stuff. But once the city guard started investigating all of these thefts the player got caught up with eventually he ended up going to jail for all of his thievery and he also stole some cursed stuff that wasn't so great for the rest of the players either i have one that i wasn't actually the dm actually none of us were the dm it was uh, another friend of ours who was running uh, it was a vampire the masquerade game and i don't remember all the details megan's character and one of our other characters inside of the back of an ambulance with a swat officer oh yeah and then throwing the swat officer out of the car car so it got the police called on us as we were trying to prevent them from finding out that vampires were in the city that that ended up in this very prolonged sequence of us trying to cover our tracks of yeah it was a tough time to try and talk our way out of why did you throw someone out of the back of this ambulance and another small one, which wasn't even nearly a negative consequence. We were playing in a, in a World of Darkness game, so it's vampire. But we were playing mortals, and we were investigating a building at night in the middle of a storm. And somebody had left a window open, and the wind blew the chair. And one of our characters reacting to that shot the chair. And so for the rest of the game, he was just known as the Chair King. Because he crit hit on the chair and just utterly obliterated it. And while it's not a DM how to deal with this, it was a consequence of an action in the game that just 
Cage became a little bit of a dig. Lighthearted, things like that that happen and build this team dynamic. The other half of managing your players is not just the behavior in game, but also that behavior out of game. I have not had this experience personally, but having to stop character harassment or character bullying. I've had other people tell me stories of things that have happened where their character ended up being so bullied by the other players that they just dropped out of a game. That's not a way you want your game to go, and that's not the kind of attitude you usually want to have. But also being sensitive to people's real-world concerns. A lot of us play D&D to escape real-world concerns. So if someone's dog has just passed away, you probably don't want to, as the dungeon master, set a horde of ravenous dogs on them that they then have to slaughter. That's one of those things that you just want to be be sensitive to. So have you guys ever had to call out players for poor behavior? And if you have, how did how did that go? How did that work? I don't think I've ever had to call out players, but as a player, I've had to call out a DM. It came down to really communication just not being there. And that's one of the things, if you have something, an event like that that's happened, the DM may not be aware of it, especially if it's not someone that you're talking to all the time. So making sure that they are, bringing it up when it does happen so they can make that change will hopefully be something that they would take to heart. Definitely. So that's about all that I have. Do you guys have any final words of wisdom that you would like to impart to people who might be trying to be a dungeon master for the first time? Your first session will probably not go the way you intend it. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. My first session, like I said, it involved a player with a grenade launcher killing the bad guy before they even really got to it. And I didn't DM for a couple of years after that because I felt I had done a bad job. That wasn't really fair to myself as my first time. The second time I played, I had these expectations of what my players could adapt and I pushed back a little harder than I should have. So it's a learning experience, but... It worked because of the group of people I had, and they were willing to work with me and learn how to play with me. And from there, I've really grown. As a DM, I would say just make sure that you're also open to feedback. If you're with a group who are your friends, they're going to, hopefully it's a group of friends that know you well enough to be able to go, hey, we're not having fun, and not have you be upset by that. The thing that I always link in this back to is playing Super Smash Brothers or something as a younger child. I'd play with these people who were really good at it, and I'd just get my butt handed to me, and I'd be like, you know what, this isn't fun right now. Can we do something else? And that's what would happen. We would do something else. So if you're DMing, just be open to that sort of, that feedback from players as well. Let them tell you if they're having fun or not and take that to heart, but not so badly that you think they're out to get you. These are supposed to be your friends. You're supposed to be having fun. So make sure that they're having fun. And also as a DM, make sure that you have fun. If you're not feeling it, make it aware to them. Because a lot of times what groups find themselves doing is going back to the same person over and over as the DM. And that can lead to DM burnout. There's a lot of work that people put into their worlds and their NPCs and making sure that the players are having a good time. And that can be a heavy toll when you're doing that weekly, even bi-weekly, even monthly. So making sure that the DM has a chance to go, you know what, I don't want to do this. Can we have someone else run? And someone else pick up that mantle. If you've played in a game, you've seen people DM, that's a good way for you to start your own process of being a DM as well. Is just, hey, that person wants to take a break. Let me give it a shot. And like Ian was just saying, you're not going to have the best game the first time. You're not going to be a critical role. That's, <laughs> that's, that's a thing that maybe people strive to hit, but except that there's going to be a little bit of a bumpy road, but it's a learning experience. And just to make sure that you're open to feedback as well as your players, that they're open to feedback. And on that note, when you're saying about the DM having fun, the last game I tried to DM after two sessions, I wasn't enjoying where it was and I didn't know how to fix it. The Star Wars game? Yeah. Man. See, we were, I know me and Val were having fun with that one too, so. Yeah, my players were having fun with it. But I wasn't, and I didn't like where it was going. And it wasn't something that wasn't the way the players were doing. It's just I didn't like how I was presenting the story in the world. So I asked to step back and actually led to the game Megan's now running because she decided to take over, which has been great. My final piece of advice is making sure there's enough room for your players to have that influence on the world and on the NPCs. There are a lot of different ways to do it. I am still really proud of when we did our Buffy the Vampire Slayer game, I made a Mad Lib for the introduction game, and I had you guys fill in the different Mad Lib slots. It took place on a college Group campus, and you guys library. told me all about, <laughs> all about this <laughs> campus, and you guys named the library the RuPaul Library. I just asked you for the name of a famous person, <laughs> and it was one of the funniest parts of that game that we 
all still remember. And I feel like when your players have that kind of influence on the world and it's something you're creating together rather than something that you as the DM are just imparting to them, it's much more memorable and much more personal to the players and they're way more invested in what's happening when they have that influence on what's going on. Well, that wraps us up. Thank you guys so much for being here. Lloyd and Ian, I really appreciate you taking the time to come talk about your Dungeon Master experience and impart some wisdom onto new players. So thank you so much for being here with me. It was a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having us and good luck to all the DMs out there. That's right. Good luck all you DMs and a happy Tabletop Thursday and play on.